but anyways, I'm just so glad to be here today. And I really, um, I didn't know what to preach. I, I'll be honest. I didn't know what to preach today. Because like back to school Sunday, right? So I could talk about the rhythms of, of life and seasons and getting back on track and all the things. And then we just followed up a worship series, right? And I'm like, okay, well, we, we just talked about worship and corporate encounters to a daily encounter. And then tonight we have Reach 9K. We have our back to school bash this evening. And uh, I'm so excited about that. Um, but I kind of had this perfect storm moment. Anybody remember the perfect storm, the movie that came out in the 2000s? Okay, I'm kind of dating myself, 2000s anyway. Some of y'all are like, what, 2000s? That's dating yourself? What? <laughs> anyway. But in the 2000s, there's this movie uh, from George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. Um, that's the only movie I've ever watched with Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney because I just watched the Chosen series. That's all else I watch. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I watch football, but I hate my team. So anyway, um, and y'all pray for me during football season. Anyway, um, but there's this movie that came out, and it is about a, a true story that happened in 1991. Um, and it's about this boat captain named Billy, who uh, is the captain for the Andrea Gale. It's a true story. And the Andrea Gale, funny enough, was based out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Right? I was like, okay, the Lord's in this. Gloucester, Gloucester. Okay, here we go. There's not too many Gloucesters, right? So as I was thinking about that story, and what happens in the perfect storm is Captain Billy has had a rough uh, season fishing. And what ends up happening is he has this bet with another boat captain, and there's just kind of competitive nature. He doesn't have any fish on this go-around. They go back. He makes this little wager, and he says, you know what? I'm going to go out further than we've ever been. I'm going to catch as much fish as I've ever caught. So what ends up happening in the story is he, he takes uh, his boat and his, his crew. He convinces them to go back out, and what ends up happening, he goes past this tropical storm. They make it through, right? Hurrah, hurrah. And he gets to this place, and he catches 1,000 pounds of fish, more than he's ever caught. But his ice maker breaks on the fishing boat. And how many know if you've got 1,000 pounds of fish, you've got to make a decision real quick, right? So there's no ice. So he decides he's going to turn back and head back to Gloucester, Massachusetts. Now, here's the problem. He went with Andrea Gale and the crew through a tropical storm. And it says, as he's making his way back, there's two storm fronts that are coming, and they're converging with a hurricane. So you've got one tropical storm this way, one tropical storm this way, and a hurricane coming from behind them. And it says it all clashes all at the same time, causing a perfect storm. And that's, that's what this uh, message was for me today. I was trying to figure out what to do and what to say and how to even uh, relay what I wanted to on my heart, but... Here's kind of how I got to today's point is one, we have this worship moment for the past seven weeks. We've talked about worship and corporate encounters and to a daily encounter with Jesus. And then on this other hand, this past Wednesday, we had Verge Youth partner with Helping the Homeless Ministries. And I don't know if you saw on Facebook, we, par we partnered with them making 500 breakfast bags for our community. And uh, in doing that, there will be 500 people fed in Gloucester and Matthews just because our young people decided to partner with helping the homeless. And then at the same time, we have these two fronts coming together, and today is August 20th, and we have Reach 9K tonight, and we're partnering with other churches in our community. And the last time we got together, we had 155 people in the place and 61 student salvations. Come on, you can get excited about that. Come on, don't leave me hanging. So you have these fronts of, of, of corporate encounter to a daily encounter. We're partnering with our community, and then we've got student salvations. And it got me to thinking to this point, and I've ran it past Pastor Daniel, Pastor Ken. What happens after your daily encounter with Jesus? What happens? Do we just go from daily encounter to daily encounter, or how does that work? Because now the culmination of all these things is we've led into a daily encounter with Jesus, but here's what I want to talk to you today about, is daily encounters with Jesus lead to Holy Spirit moments with other people. I'll say that one more time. Daily encounters with Jesus lead to Holy Spirit moments with others. How I many know when we receive Jesus in a daily encounter, we can't become hoarders of Jesus, right? It's my Jesus, right? I'm not going to give, I got to have enough Jesus, 
Well, the tension and problem with that is if you begin to hoard Jesus, you won't need him daily. So what happens is, is sometimes we don't have a daily encounter with him, so the moments we do have with him, we keep him to ourselves and we don't have enough to give to anyone else. But if we had daily encounters with him, we would have enough of Jesus to hand out to people who needed him. May we as the church begin to give our daily encounters of Jesus away to other people. I want to ask you today, what would our county, county look like if all of us did that? Every person we came in contact with in Gloucester County, what would our county look like in a month, six months, a year? If we took our corporate gatherings to a daily encounter to now we're giving Jesus to everyone we come in contact with. What would the future of the church look like? This is a sticking point for me. Because I hear Barna numbers and all these numbers saying there's young people fleeing the church. They don't want to come to church. What would happen if we mobilize those students to give Jesus away? I wonder if they stick around a little bit longer. And can I be honest? I feel like that our generation in church culture isn't really about the Great Commission anymore. We're about the Great Omission. Where our generation is saying it's easier to just worry about me that we leave out the people around us who need Jesus. How many can relate to that in somebody else's life? Not your own, right? Somebody else's. You know somebody. But I wonder how our county would be different if we truly let the Holy Spirit use our daily encounter with Jesus. Church, I wonder what we would look like if we let the Holy Spirit use our daily encounter with Jesus. Because how many know it's not about just changing the world, it's changing us. The whole goal was for you not to change the entire America. The whole goal was for you to change you, which changes your family. Then from your family, it changes your neighborhood. Your neighborhood to your county, and the county to America. We're preaching, God save America. What, what if we just said, he, God, can you save me so I can save my family? What if we reversed it a little bit? So today, let's dive into a message. I'm not going to be long because I got a lot of stuff to say. I mean, well, I, I won't tell you my pages of notes anyways. You're going to get scared. You're going to leave. Anyway, today, let's dive into a, today's message entitled, My Faith, His Power, Their Healing. Let's say it together. My Faith, My faith. His Power, power. Their healing. healing. Let's do it one more time. My Faith, My faith. His power, power, Their Healing. If you got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 5. We got that on the Sky Bible. Come on. Can we give it up for the tech team in the back? Come on. Each and every week, they make sure that we get our Bible in. It says this, Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26. Hey, I encourage you to take notes today as well. I encourage you to highlight in your Bible because you never know when you're going to need it, right? Okay. Also, let me just pause on my message. I want to highlight something today. Today, as I was walking in, and this is total side note, do you know there's people praying for you before you even get here? And I saw something, I caught revelation on it today. I meet with Joe Mitchell in the back, shout out to Joe. Every Sunday we have a little mentor thing at Starbucks, right? Because who doesn't like Starbucks? And Right, here we go. So anyway, but I saw something today, and I just want to shout him out just for a minute. I got out of my truck, and I saw Donovan leaving his car. And Donovan walked from the side of that parking lot over here with his hand stretched over the building and prayed from the time he got to his, from the car to the front door. Someone was praying for you today. Great job, Donovan. Pastor Alex got all eyes, just so you know. I'm also on social media, so y'all don't act up on social media. Here we go. Verse 17, on one of those days as he was teaching, meaning Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Next slide. How many know this? You have to know the signs and times of what the Lord is doing in the moment. It says that the power of the Lord was with him to heal. I wonder how many times the power of the Lord is with him to heal in these moments, but we don't realize what he's doing. May we not be a church that doesn't know what the Lord's doing in the house. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. 
But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let down his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. How many has heard that passage of Scripture before? See, I have too. I've heard this passage of Scripture before, but as I was praying about it, there's a different feel that I had with this passage of Scripture when it comes to our daily encounter with Jesus, letting the Holy Spirit lead us to others. So in this passage of Scripture, there's three points that I want to bring out to you today when it comes to a Holy Spirit encounter with others. Point number one, if you're taking notes, is we see people differently. See, notice in the text, there's people going to see Jesus. And he had returned to Capernaum, found in Mark, Mark's gospel. And it says that some scholars believe that Jesus either owned a house there or he had a room to rent because he had so much time there in Capernaum. And what ends up happening is Jesus is teaching. There's Pharisees there. And this shows Jesus' deity is son of man, savior of the world, right? And here's what happens is, there was popularity spreading about Jesus that so many people showed up that the people that were bringing the man on the mat could not even get in. Now, how many know this had to be really popular because this is before Snapchat and social media, right? If you don't know what Snapchat is, let's talk about Facebook or MySpace, right? Older generation, you may be on Facebook. So anyways, this word is spreading about Jesus. And on the way, these four guys run across this paralyzed man on their way to Jesus. Now, there's a whole bunch of people that are on their way to go see Jesus in this house church, but yet the Gospel of Luke highlights four individuals that find a man who's paralyzed and highlight their story. Now, I wish Luke would go into a lot more detail about the journey of this individual because I feel like there's a lot of banter back and forth. But you know what's interesting is in the midst of all the crowds going to sit under Jesus, we find these four guys and they encounter a paralyzed or lame man. And most of the people on the way to Jesus would have probably passed him by, not thinking twice of it. But yet these four men stopped, and this guy had no one to rely on, yet these four guys did something that the rest of the crowd didn't, as they saw him differently. This guy was socially unclean, politically outcast, morally forgotten. He was unclean, a burden, and inconvenience. Why does it matter? Let's go back to the text for a minute. Next slide. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. It's interesting to me. You have this man on a mat. As you can tell, my yoga mat is not brand new, and I do yoga all the time. (laughs) My wife's not in here, so she can't vouch for me. This is not brand new. I use this all the time, Pastor Kim, right before staff. I'm just kidding. No, I don't. If I did yoga, y'all going to have to call an ambulance or something because I'm going to get stuck. (laughs) But we find this man on a mat, and it says in the text, what is his name in the text? Do we know? We don't know. Why? Because the Bible describes him as the world seen him as a paralyzed mat, paralyzed man on a mat. And it's interesting why. Because how the world would have seen him is just paralyzed man. Why? Because his identity became, was his limitation. His crippling circumstance became his name tag. And the world would have seen him that way. But yet, in his limitation, in being stuck on this mat, in being paralyzed, being socially unclean, these four men saw past his limitation and crippling circumstances 
and decided to see him differently. Interesting, right? You say, how do we know that they saw them differently? Because of their actions. See, because of their actions, they let their experience with Jesus determine their actions. Can I give you a cursor, a precursor to how, how you want to know how you see people? Your actions will tell you first. How do you respond to that coworker? How do you respond to that family member at Thanksgiving? What about the church member at the previous church? Uh-uh. So how do we see people differently? Through the lens of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm honest with you, the people we see differently don't change first. How we see them changes first. See, the man on the mat didn't change. His circumstance didn't change. But the men who saw him saw him first differently. See, when you're working out the thing with the Holy Spirit, you take your daily encounter with Jesus, the Holy Spirit leads you to someone else. How many know the people on the mat don't change? You change first. That's right. That same person has been on that same street corner for two years. But yet, you're letting the Holy Spirit use you for the first time, and now you're saying, I never noticed him that way. How many has ever been there before? Where you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work something out in you. He's not changing. His situation doesn't change. The people are the one that change. So when it comes to seeing people differently, we first have to change ourselves before they change themselves. And if I'm honest with you, the people we see differently don't change. One beautiful title that Jesus calls the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. John 16, 13. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. The Holy Spirit will help lead and guide us in truth. And those who follow him are sons and his daughters. Romans 8, 14, 16 says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful as slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. When we spend time in a daily encounter with Jesus, you begin to change. And when you begin to change, your view begins to change. Can I be honest with you? It's hard to stay mad or offended at someone when you realize that Jesus died for them too. Uh -oh. It's hard to pass by someone who needs help when they realize they have the same access to grace of God that you do. It's hard to label someone wrongfully when they have the same access to the blood of Christ that we all do. I wonder how many of us, church, can I be honest? I wonder how many of us, just personal conviction of mine when I was writing this message, not only did I, I, I haven't seen people differently, I wonder how many times I've labeled people incorrectly. Yeah, that family member, yep, he is the black sheep of the family. That coworker is a no good. Yeah, my kid is this. My ex-spouse is that. Right? And I'm not negating hurts and offenses and all the things, but when it comes to letting the Holy Spirit use you in the life of other people, we first have to determine, have we even labeled people wrong? Have we labeled people in our circle by them circumstances? Have we labeled people in our own circles by the choices they've made? I wonder if we can retrospect for a minute how many people in our lives have labeled us wrongly. I can't tell you how many times I got labeled growing up being the kid of a single mom who was disabled. Oh, they'll always have no money. Oh, he probably won't graduate. He'll be just like his daddy. And I can't, remember, I can't tell you how it felt to be labeled that way, but yet we get stuck in this cycle in our world where we'll begin to label other people because people label us. I wonder if we'll be a generation in a church that chooses not to label people based on their circumstance or how we feel about them or all the things. Will we let our daily encounter with Jesus bubble up enough that the Holy Spirit can use us to speak life into people again? Can you imagine how that paralytic fe felt being on his mat? being kicked on, spit on, socially outcast, and four people stopped for the first time. He didn't even know where he was going. 
Can you imagine that moment? He was stuck on a mat and four people actually stopped to talk to him. I wonder the people in our lives, do they see us going to Jesus each time? And we pass by them stuck on their mat? Do they know that you go to church all the time, that you're in the study, that you lead this, that, my life? Do they know you're Pastor Alex and you lead ministries and all the things and yet you won't stop to talk to me? And I'm not even talking about people we don't know. I'm talking about the people in your life that you do know. There's people in my life when I was writing this message that I need to send a text message to. Just repenting because of how I've labeled them based on their circumstance. See, when we spend time in a daily encounter with Jesus, you begin to change. And when you begin to change, your view begins to change. Point number one, we see people differently. Point number two is this is we act on their needs compassionately. Everybody say, act. act. See, the text reads that the four friends encountered a paralyzed man and brought him to the house where Jesus was ministering. There's an awful lot of context missed in the writing. And think about it. This wasn't just another task for these men. This wouldn't have been on their checklist on the way to go see Jesus. They would have stumbled upon this opportunity And one, they they chose to see the man on the mat. That's the first step. You have to see them differently. But how many know there's a difference between seeing a need and then acting on a need? Here's the thing. They had to make a decision past seeing a need. They had to make a decision to act. And see, that's compassion. These four guys carried the paralyzed man in their hearts before they ever carried him physically through a city. I'll say that one more time. Those four men saw him differently and decided to carry him in their hearts before they ever carried him physically through a city. When was the last time we carried people's burdens in our hearts before we acted upon it? What would our world look like if we carried people in our hearts before we ever carried them physically? I wonder what it would look like if we returned back to the prayer of our youth. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. What if we committed to a new prayer and said, God, put their hurt on my heart until they are healed. God, I want a burden on my heart so bad for these people in my life that I don't want it to leave until they're fully healed. I don't want to just pass by and, okay, I did my deed for today. No, no, no. I wonder what our world would look like if we put hurts on our heart to the point where we saw them to full healing. And can I be honest with you today, church? Can I be real? Our compassion doesn't need to make a point. Too many times we're only compassionate as the body of Christ when we can make a point. But too often the church has known what we stand against rather than we actually stand for, and I believe it's time that that changed. My generation prayed that same prayer. I remember being in youth. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. How many ever prayed that prayer? God, break my heart for what breaks yours, right? Here's what's interesting. As we've prayed that prayer, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. We've prayed, God, send me to the four corners of the earth for you. See, we want to go to the four corners of the nation but we won't go to the four corners of a mat and pick someone up in our neighborhood. Why would God ever send us to the four corners of the earth when we can't go to the four corners in our neighborhood? Why, is this too much of a burden? Is it too convenient? Is it too local? What would it look like? What would our generation look like if we stopped at the four corners of the mat before we ever went into the world and changed the world? I wonder what our posture would look like. I wonder how we would look like differently. Church, I wonder, can can we bring compassion back to the church? Now, I'm not saying that we've lost compassion fully, but I wonder if we lean into compassion that we all had compassion again. And, And you may say, well, Pastor Alex, how do I have compassion again? Because if I'm honest with you, me being a 30 year old man, sometimes life just beats you up. Sometimes the way I grew up, it takes compassion from you really easy. Well, how I grew up, they grew up the same. I can't, uh uh-uh. 
I got to watch out for me and mine. I don't worry about them. They don't know how I grew up. They don't know my struggles. They don't know. Sometimes life has a way of sucking compassion out of you. But you say, Pastor Alex, how do I have compassion again? You know how we have compassion again? Is we remember there was a time when we were on our own mat. I think so often we see other people's mats and we, we kind of judge and label, but there was a time that all of us were on our own mat. Do you remember the time that you were on your mat when you were addicted to something and you couldn't get out of your crippling circumstance? And someone had to bring you to Jesus? Do you remember when th there was times in your marriage that were rocky and bumpy and you didn't know how you were going to make it, and yet someone walked with you through all the way to Jesus? I don't know your story, but here's what I do know is all of us have a Matt story. We've all been labeled by a crippling circumstance in the moment. We've all identified the thing that has held us down, and yet someone in their Holy Spirit moment came along and took us to Jesus. That's how we bring compassion back, is we don't leave too far from our testimony. We're not too good to tell the story of Jesus and what he's done in our lives. I wonder what it would look like if we remembered our own mat for a minute and the life change we saw. Think about it for a minute. There was a time before Jesus came in that you were stuck on your own mat based on how the world saw you. When we look through that lens, we have compassion again. Can I be honest with you today? There's, and I even felt like I was writing this, there's someone in here today that you may feel like you're stuck on your mat. There's someone in here today that you have had life circumstances beat you down to the point where you are labeled by the thing that you struggle with. But can I encourage you today? There's people around you today that will help carry you to Jesus. Even if you're on your mat and you're struggling for a way to get off, you've had no one come in, people have labeled you, you're stuck in a circumstance, you don't know how to find, find your way out, there are people around you that care about you that will take you to Jesus. And if you don't have them, come find me. We'll find you some people. You don't have to stay on your mat. So point number one, we begin to see people differently. Point number two is we act on their needs compassionately. Point number three is we give Jesus boldly. Everybody say boldly. boldly. Notice in the text, let's go back to the text. Towards the end, just keep on sliding. Yep. Okay, go back one. Sorry, I told you too far. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the towels into the mist before Jesus. How many know when it comes to giving people to Jesus or giving Jesus away boldly, you got to get creative. Life will put people in your path that will block Jesus for you. What does it say? There was no more room in the house. There were so many people in this house church that they couldn't bring the people that needed Jesus in. I wonder if that was a depiction of our American church today. It's too crowded that we bring people that need Jesus in. Uh, we'll leave that alone. But yet, this is what happens. These men decided in their hearts to carry this paralyzed man that could offer them nothing to Jesus. And the house was blocked. How many know they could have easily left him at the doorstop and say, oh, sorry, he's already, he's already passed his intro. I got to get in there. But no, these people had such a burden on their heart for this paralyzed man that I could do nothing for them that they knew from their Holy Spirit encounter that they have to get this man to Jesus boldly. So what did they do? They worked in unity together. They said, hey, someone grab a ladder. Someone grab some hammers. We're going to figure out a way to put this guy on the roof and start tearing towels off the roof. Church, when was the last time we gave Jesus away that boldly? When was the last time that we said, I'm going to find a ladder, I'm going to get on a roof, I'm going to go above and beyond just to make sure you get to Jesus? Why? Because our world needs Jesus. 
How selfish is it of us as the church that has the answer to life's problems and yet we won't take Jesus to them boldly? He's the one that's changed my whole life. And I sit on that? Are you kidding me? I won't climb a roof and tear off some tiles for someone else's life change? And then I got to thinking, Pastor Daniel, what if the person that told me about Jesus never tore the roof off for me? Would I be on the stage today? Probably not. But yet there was people that carried me to Jesus in my brokenness, in my sin, in my shame, and said, I'm not going to stop until you get Jesus. I'm going to get on top of a roof, and I'm going to do physical work. I'm going to pull off tiles. I don't care how much it takes, how long it takes. I'm going to make sure you get to Jesus. I'm going to use my time. I'm going to use my resources. I'm going to use my strength and get nothing in return just for their healing. What? How crazy is that? No, it's not crazy at all because it's, it's happened in my life. It's happened in your life. What would happen if we gave Jesus away boldly again? Where it's not in the confines of this church. Where we use our time, money, efforts beyond what we've ever known. Just to get people to Jesus. I remember when me and Grace first got married in 2017. We were first married and my mom had passed in 2015 and I was at my first pastorate in 2017. And it was on my burden, on my heart, because my mom had never heard me preach the gospel. I said, okay. The one person I cared about most never heard me preach the gospel. But I still have a dad. Well, growing up, we went to a little Baptist church in Chester. My dad was a deacon there, and what ended up happening is the pastor had a moral failure, and it hurt my dad so deeply. To the, to the point where he swore he'd never go to church again. And now his son is becoming a pastor. So you imagine the little bit of hurt and devastation that's there. The thing that hurt me so deeply I gave my life to, and now you've shattered my worldview. I'm never going to that again, and now my son's a pastor? Doesn't make sense to me. But I knew in that moment, my dad not going back to church again meant that he was on his own mat. 2017, I, I took a pastor at 20 minutes from his house. And I would pray and pray that he would show up to hear me preach, and he never did. And I couldn't find a way to get him to church. Didn't know how to do it. I'd have special services. I'd have all these sayings. Couldn't get him there. Then I had this thought. What if I don't give him an option? My burden for my dad was so heavy, I had to come up with a creative way to give Jesus boldly again. So one Sunday morning, I, I got on the phone 10 minutes before service started. I said, Dad, I don't know what you're doing this Sunday morning, but get dressed. I said, where are we going? I said, Grace is at your door right now, and you're coming to church with me today. And you can't say no to your daughter-in-law, right? That's just how that works. But do you know he got dressed? He came with Grace to church that day. And from that moment forward, he has attended church every single Sunday since. Why? Not because of what I did. I just chose to give him Jesus boldly again. Where nothing else worked, that I had to start ripping off roof tiles and lower him before Jesus. Why? Because I knew that my dad needed Jesus again. Will we get bold again for our generation? Will we get bold for our families again? Church, how many family members do we know that we need to rip the roof off for? Let's not even focus on our neighborhood. What about your kids? What about your spouse? What about your parents? Will we rip the roof off again for them? What about the next generation? Will we be so concerned about their spiritual health that we will volunteer and give money and give time that we will rip the roof off and lower them before Jesus that it's all up to Jesus, it's not on to me anymore? Will at our spaces and our work, will we give them Jesus boldly again? Will we put them in a corner not to try to force anything on them? We just know how important Jesus is. 
Will we do that for our loved ones? Do we care enough as the church to have compassion, to give people Jesus boldly again? Church, it's time we give people Jesus again. Outside of these four walls. And here's the thing. You don't rip the roof off just because you rip the roof off because you know who's inside the house. You know that the healer is the one in the house. And what ends up happening, because they rip the roof off and they lower him before Jesus, it says this, that the man that was paralyzed had his sins forgiven. You know he didn't make a prayer. He didn't respond to an altar call. You know what the text says? The text says, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. I wonder how many people in our world are, rel- are waiting on our faith to come into action. I wonder how many people's lives would be changed if we really put motivation behind our faith. Say, you know what? I'm going to use my faith as leverage to get you healed. Why? Because you need it. We need to give Jesus again. And you say, well, Pastor Alex, how do we give Jesus boldly? Notice in the text what happens. Is Jesus tells this paralyzed man who's once identified by the mat that he laid on, the circumstance that he struggled with. He tells him, take up your mat, go home. Take up your mat, go home. Let's read it in the text. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Next verse. And immediately... He rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Next verse. And amazement seized them all, and they were glorified God, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. You know how we give Jesus boldly? As we take up our own mat and we walk home glorifying God. How many of us have been laid dormant on our mat that we've left it behind? Jesus has healed us, he sanctified us, he's redeemed us, but yet we won't tell our story about what happened on our mat. That's the testimony. Uh, We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. You overcome by what happened on your mat. That's how we give Jesus boldly. You don't need some formula, you don't need anything. You know how I give Jesus boldly? As I was once a sinner. And yet by his redeeming grace, I am made new. I was caught in my sins and nowhere to go, and yet the grace of God, someone brought me on a mat before Jesus, and I responded to an altar call, and my life has never been the same. And I'll tell you the story. I was a senior in in high school. I had went to a party the night before. I was not in my right mind the day of, and my mom dragged me to church that day. Thank God for praying mamas, right? And there was a lady named Prophet Rejoice who came to our little storefront church in Hopewell, Virginia. And she had a sand bucket. The Lord had told her to bring a sand bucket in that place and said, you're going to speak prophetically over someone today. And she saw me in the back, called me by name and said, Alex, come up front. I had no idea who she was. She said, the Lord just spoke your name and said, I need to give you this sand bucket to dig out the wounds of a father wound that you had. The power of God hit that place. I sobered up in that moment. I gave my life to Jesus again. And now I tell youth all the time about my story. Why? Because that's how we give him boldly to people. May you not be ashamed of the mat that you were once on. I want to break that off of you right now. Your past is not shameful. Your past is not a disgrace. Why? Your past is a testimony by the redeeming grace of God. How dare we stay dormant on our mat and not pick it up and glorify God? That's the key. Is you take your mat, you go back to the place that people knew you, and you glorify him all the more. Doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter because I've been redeemed. I've been picked up from my mat. i got to give God the glory because of what he's done. He's been too good. He's been way too good. Church, we're a city on a hill, not a house on a block. Be bold with Jesus today. Hey, as I close, I'm going to talk to a few people today.